What's good, you guys? It's DJ Dean here, back here once again. And today, people, today we're back for another just relaxing Clockwork 3 chill time. Just chill time. Just chill. Um, as far as I know, this is a single book. Um, all rights reserved to their respective owners. So, Matthew J. Kirby, everything respected to him, and the other way around for the other one. Anywho, you guys, today, in today's episode, we are going to cover, um, chapter two, and just as a slight recap, um, we have Giuseppe, um, we met Giuseppe in the last chapter, um, he is a street boy orphan from Italy, he is age 11, um, let me see, what else did we learn about him? I'm actually still recording on Thanksgiving. It's like, Thanksgiving, a time not to work. I'm recording all day. I might not be, you know, uploading much. I upload a Happy Thanksgiving video, but I'm recording all day. Anywho, you guys, so if you are happy that we are back, make sure to smash out that like button for me. And if you like what you watch, please subscribe. It does a lot to help me. Thank you very much. Actually, it really doesn't. I don't get paid in any way, shape, and form for this. But anyway, so, um, Giuseppe is apparently getting punished. Because he gave his money to someone else, which it's kind of weird that if you're not allowed to give away money, why is money allowed to be stolen? It, it makes no sense to me. But anyway, in today's episode, we are reading Chapter 2, Coal Shoots and Clockworts. Clockworts. Um, just so you know, this chapter is, it starts on 13 and it ends on 24. So we have a lot of work to cover in today's episode. I know I read very slow. But, um, it actually helps me to concentrate when I'm recording it, because then it's like, mm, it's not so bad, because it's actually got a purpose. You know, I don't read a lot because I can't find a book to interest me enough, or a book to just, you know, be like, hey, you know what, this would be cool. So, that's what we're covering in today's episode. Um, I figured out, when I watched the last episode, um, what I suggest for you guys to do... Um, honestly, it really doesn't matter, since the picture will always be this. The picture will always be the exact same. I guess it doesn't matter, but apparently whenever you watch it in a horizontal plane, the picture is tiny. Um, if you really care about the picture and want to, like, watch it at the same time as you're just listening to it, um, I may or may not decide to put music behind it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. It all depends. It all depends. It all depends. So, um, I want to ask you guys in today's episode, and possibly in the next update slash Education Friday, um, whether or not we should put music to this, you know, just like calming, relaxing music. I don't know. You let me know, and I'll make it happen. Or maybe I'll do it off and on, because, you know... Some people might be like, well, it just distracts you from the book, which is true. And some people like, well, the book by itself is kind of bland. It's like, why don't I just read the book? I don't know. Um, I'm trying to get my accents down for uh, Giuseppe. So for Giuseppe, it's like, you mean this? You mean this? You mean this? I don't know. And Ezio will have to be like, he said you had a new one. So... I don't know. Um, I just want to let you guys know, I do not have any girl, like, um, accents, so, um, I can share my best, but if we run into an important girl character, we won't get very far. <laughs> so, anyway. <clears throat> Today, Frederick searched for the scrap metal that would become the chest plate of the clockwork man. See, so, we're not... We're not, we're no longer with Giuseppe. We're on Frederick. Okay. He patrolled the factory yards and the dry docks, hands in his pockets, scanning jagged piles of discarded iron and steel. He had the rough dimensions and measurements in his, in mind, but would only know the piece once he found it. And when he did find it, the clockwork man would be nearly complete. Everything except for the head. He had known from the beginning that the head would be the most challenging obstacle in the construction of his automaton. Automaton is that I believe that's how you say it. A U O T O M A T O N. Uh, just so you guys know, I'm spelling everything I don't know how to spell. So if you guys know how it's pronounced, because I'm an idiot, 
and just can't pronounce things correctly, then you can tell me in the comments section down below what it sounds like, or give me, I don't know. But he also knew it would be the most impressive and brilliant aspect of his accomplishment. Once it was complete, there would be no denying his freedom from apprenticeship. He would have his own shop, his own designs. Frederick would be the youngest journeyman clockmaker in the world, but also the greatest. Okay, so we're going to go back to history for a moment. I just learned about this in world history class, actually. So... The way things worked, time out, time out. Okay, guys, I'm back. I'm sorry for the interruption. Actually, um, something very interesting. Um, shout outs to Mo Bison. You know, for all of this, for all the like clean cutness you see in Kingdom Rush and Vector that you and Roller Coaster Tycoon that you just don't see in Star Wars. Why don't you see it in Star Wars? Because the only way to do that is to have a capture card, which is expensive, and I do not have the money for it. So anyway, back back to what we were reading. I didn't find a, a time period. All I know that guilds started becoming a thing in the 1100s. So, unfortunately, I could not find a definitive date, but doesn't matter. Let's keep going. He came to the docks where the wavers sagged under the weight of gaggles of street people. Mas Master Branch? That's what it says. Master Branch had mentioned something about a wrecked ship with its hull ripped open on the rocks and goods strewn around the harbor. All these people must have descended to see what they could salvage from the disaster. Quite a nuisance, really. But he thought that perhaps there might be something interesting he could use. Let me just explain for one minute. So Oh, wait, 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 wait. This, this next line I'll explain. Oh. Someone bumped into him. Pardon me. A busker boy shoved past Frederick, carrying a violin case. What I was just about to explain, which would have ruined that line, is that we went back in time. You know, it's like, it's a fictional narrative. We're starting to connect the story of all three of the people, which we mentioned in the first episode. So if you don't know who the third person is and you want to know now, you can always, you know, go back and check that out. But, 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 we're connecting the time periods. So, even though this is a second chapter, it had the events that we ended the first chapter off with haven't started yet. See, Frederick just got bumped in by Giuseppe, which means that it's still that time, but now we know Frederick's side of the story, instead of just Giuseppe's. So, it's going on at the same time. Frederick opened his mouth to reply, but the boy hurried on without a look back. The storm had left pow powdery clouds behind, a shade of blue in the sky that showed all that sh that showed all the other blues what they should look like. Frederick pushed into the crowd and peered down at the debris floating in the water, mostly fragments of wood and broken furniture, and the occasional dress or sh the occasional dress or shirt or bolt or fabric un undulating. U N D U L A T I N G undulating with the waves. I know that's wrong. Uh, another thing I should mention is to all you literature people out there, I'm sorry, but the book specifically says or or or. I don't know why. It's probably the time period, which I can't. I need something to narrow it down, or the book has to tell me because I cannot figure it out. Or I can look it up on Google. <laughs> I'll probably do that before the next recording and be like, oh, apparently it's this year. Anyway, several chests several chests had been hauled up to the pier and opened. People rooted through them like maggots, nothing of use to him. Frederick pulled out a handkerchief and held it to his nose against the 
pervasive pervasive smell of the ducks, the fish decay, mildew, and seaweed. But these hundreds of working men and women dumped their own overwhelming odors of sweat, filth, and machine oil into the air. They laugh and argued around him, grease smeared and vacant, 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 excuse me, eyed. Their sense and commotion set his head to pounding. He rubbed his temple and his temples and closed his eyes. When he opened them, he saw her. Mrs. Uh, there's probably a formal way to pronounce this, but it literally spells like treeless. Why? Mrs. Treeless. Oh, by the way, if you hear anything in these videos, you hear nothing outside of this room. Which, my windows are closed, and my door is shut all the way. I can't close it anymore without breaking the hinges. So, whatever you hear, I'm sorry, I apologize. I don't have really a lot of noise cancelingness. <clears throat> I really hope it's not recording them. If they are, I'm sorry. If they're not, don't worry about it. Miss Treeless, unmoving and poised like an iron stake driven into the crowd. Her tiny eyes had found him, too, and she glared. Then she opened her mouth in a toothless grin. The sight of her unlocked doors and threw them wide onto so many memories that Frederick had kept shut away. He froze and began to pant. His stomach ached with remembering hunger. His arms dropped to his sides, exhausted and weak, his back twisted, anticipating blows that did not fall anyone any more. She bore a mild, passive smile, lingered for a few moments, and then turned away from him, vanishing into the chaos. Frederick had to get out of the mob and away from the awful memories pressing in. Oh my gosh. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Where were we? He... F yeah, 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 he forced his way through the crowd of bodies, shaking with his eyes on the ground. He stumbled from the docks and down the open streets, and he eventually found a quiet spot where he leaned against a coal cart. Frederick began through his nose, inhaling slow and deep. It's all right, he said to himself. It's all right. The flutter of panic subsided, and the trembling left his bones. You all right there, son? The coal man looked like a shadow of himself. All dusted black, he held a feed sack up, up for his mule, and the animal munched away, oblivious to anything else that was going on. I'm, I'm fine. You sure? You're white as a plucked turkey. Thank you, but I'm really, f I'm fine. I just need to catch my breath. The coal man patted his mule's neck. Solomon here thinks he's a thoroughbred? Throughbed? T-H-O-R-O-U-G-H-B-R-E-D. You know, this is probably just old language that I really can't read. And he eats like one, so it'll be a while yet before he, before we get back on our route. You're welcome to hop in the cart and for a sit. Thank you, but I... Frederick looked in the cart. The bed was half filled with coal. And with... And... Wait, there's not an end. With a couple of wide shovels laid on top of the pile. And a chute for pouring the coal down into people's... Basements from the street. The memories of the workhouse re retreated. Frederick measured with his eye, cut to the right length, a coal chute like that would wrap right around the clockwork man. Frederick walked up casual like to the coal man and rubbed behind one of the mules on ears. Is your chute made of tin? Yep, got to be lightweight so I. so I. so's. Which is also an old-fashioned word. It's got to be lightweight so eyes so's I can haul it. Do all Coleman have one? Sure. Or sure. Frederick nodded. 
I think I'm feeling better now. You look better. Thanks. You have a nice evening. Solomon, too. You do the same, son. Frederick marched off. He knew of a yard down on the river where barges hauled in coal for the city and where coal men went to pick up their loads. He was bound to find a spare chute lying around. To get there, he followed ba he followed basketry, which cut a broad and angled path through the city. From its crowns at Gilbert Square, the busy road ran by the docks and the shipyards, skirted skirted the dense and dangerous ten, ten, tenements. I don't know. I think it's spelled different from tenants. T e n e m e n t s. So many e's, so many n's, and two t's. And it's only weird. I think it's and bottomed out at the quay on the river Delilah, where the tanners and butchers dumped their toxins and offal, and where the seaward current carried the foul sludge into the bay. The quay blared with the shouting and cursing of longsmen, the bleating of farm animals, and the, ch the clanging of machinery, and the thumping of barrels and crates. Foreign goods entered the city by way of the harbor, but local goods came in from the countryside by river barge at the quay. Frederick, ke Frederick kept his hands and arms in close and tried to be as small as he could. He bolstered himself against the crowd and merged with the swirling traffic of merchants, laborers, cattle, and carts that stretched for a quarter mile along the river. A cloud of gray dust hung over the coal yard at the far end. Frederick kept his eye on that spot and one hand picked Wait, and one hand on his pocket. He had been picked clean in the... He had been... He had been picked clean in places like this, where people were so unpredictable and out of control. Frederick felt the cool prickle of sweat on his back. Before he reached the coal yard, he had been jabbed up in the leg by a billy goat's horns, sworn sworn at by multiple men he bumped into, and glared at by a pretty young woman for seemingly no reason at all. Frederick came to the coal yard's high wooden fence and followed it to the gate. Hold on guys, I'm gonna take a break for one second. Wait, what? Okay, guys, we're back, we're back, we're back. Um, I'm sorry, it's just really hot in here, because, um, right now we're supposed to have the windows open so air can circulate instead of wasting air conditioning, but, um, so I don't get a copyright claim from copyrighted, uh, all rights reserved to itself, the Macy's Parade and the Dog Show, I have to keep my door shut all the way tight, I have to keep my window shut all the way tight, just so I can record, You're probably like, well, why don't you record on another day, because I'm worried about Star Wars, this might have to go up in place of Star Wars for a while, which makes me super duper sad, because that means the only... For some reason, the computer's not charging on my Star Wars, which means either A, I'm going to have to take out the hard drive, put it in a different computer, and then, like, take out, like, upload it, like, quicker that way. I have to do that, or I will have to... I'll have to find another way to charge the battery, like, put it in a different computer and charge it like that. But I don't have another one, so... It's an old computer, but it was so close. It makes me so angry. Anyway, back to the actual story that you came here to listen to. 
Coleman passed through the entrance with empty carts, and they rolled back out fully laden. Before entering, men had to put out their pipes and cigars, so at not a risk of igniting the explosive dust in the air. So, just in case you guys didn't already know, coal is what is used to power furnaces or fires. Um, so, in this case, because there's so much coal... You know, coal is just rock, and rock can be in many different forms. So, rock can also be like dust in the air, right? The dust off the rock. (coughs) Excuse me. So, that means that any of the dust in the air, with one light of a cigar, poof, the entire place explodes. That's not fun. Anyway, let's keep going. Where was I? A few of them lingered at the exit gate to relight. Frederick learned, leaned toward them, listening. You believe that storm? One of them asked another. It was a bad one. My roof leaked all night. Had to leave my boy home today on account of he got sick from the damp. <sighs> Landlords, he spent. It's not so bad. Rent's cheap, so I can't complain too awful much. You wouldn't complain if th- you, if that worthless roof of yours ripped clean off, O'Malley. Through the entry gate, Frederick spotted the huge black mounds of coal bulking under high-roofed structures. He sneaked in alongside a cart, and once through, he dodged behind a nearby shed. He ducked down and surveyed the yard. Coleman backed their carts up to the mounds and then worked to the pile them full. Dark rocks rained down, and to a man the workers were blackened. There were shovels everywhere, but no coal chutes that Frederick could see. He evaluated his chances of finding an unused chute. He crept toward for, he crept forward until he was at eye level with the window into the shed. He peered through the dirty glass. More shovels stacked inside, some other tools, but in a corner of a cup but in a corner, a couple of coal chutes leaned up against the wall. Frederick tried the window and it creaked open. He looked around to make sure no one was watching. Then he climbed in. What is he getting himself into? We're going to have problems. The dusty air in the shed choked him, and he wiped his eyes. The chutes were old and battered, but he could pound out the dents back at the workshop. So he picked up the better of the two and lifted it. It weighed more than he had expected, but he could manage it. Frederick set it down and opened the shed door. He swung out. He swung the chute up and over the rest and over to rest it on the back on his back, his hands over his head to hold it steady. He stepped out, pretending no one knew pretending he knew exactly what he, where he was going and what he was doing. No one stopped him as he crossed the yard until he reached the exit gate where a foreman checked paper receipts to make sure the coal men had paid for the, their loads. Frederick tried to slip past him. I have to give this guy an Irish accent. Oi, where are you going with that? Frederick turned his whole body around, swinging the coal chute. It fell off our cart. I was just coming back from him. The foreman folded his hairy arms across his chance. Whose cart? Um... My pa- my paws. Who's your pa? This is gonna get really funny. O'Malley, um, O'Malley. The foreman's eyes narrow. O'Malley, huh? Frederick bounced a little. Come on, mister, my paw's waiting for me. All right, then. Go on with you. Frederick sprung around and left the coal yard behind. With the chute on his back and the thick crowds on the quay would make it difficult to return the way he'd came. He cut through an alley and came out onto an unfamiliar street. He considered asking for directions, 
but thought that he could certainly find his way well enough on his own. He followed the street and then followed another, trying to head in the general direction of Master Branch's workshop. He stopped every few blocks to give his back a rest from bending and to straighten out his neck. He took a few wrong turns and hit a few dead ends until he became locked. Lost. Hours passed, and the set the s- the setting sunlight sh- tipped the tops of the buildings, tossing the narrow streets into shadow. It would be full dark soon. There was no question now. Frederick needed to ask for directions, but he hated doing so. He looked around at the pedestrians, sharing sharing the quiet street with him. Three grumpy-looking men milled outside a tobacco. A tobacco nist. It says tobacco hyphen and then down on the next line nist. So I'm just gonna say tobacco nist shop. But but we're not saying much to each other. A washerwoman carrying a heavy bundle of laundry over her head trudged by him with an expression of such exhaustion that Frederick did not feel right asking her for anything. Then he spotted a young woman wearing a white apron, and the maid's kerchief, K-E-R-C-H-I-E-F, kerchief, over chestnut hair. She looked to be about his age. Excuse me, Frederick sat down the cold shoot. Could I trouble you for directions? She smiled. I haven't seen your cart and donkey, if that's what you're looking for. She she had large green eyes. What? Oh, the coal shoe. I'm not a... No, I'm not a coalman. Then why are you carrying that around? Frederick shook his head, irritated. I need the metal. Look, can you give me directions or not? She per, pursed... Per, pursed? P-U-R-S-E-D? I swear, I cannot read. Her lips and nodded. Where do you need to go? Gilbert Square. I've just come from there. I heard a noise. I hope that was nothing. Anyway, she pursued her lips and nodded. Where do you need to go? Gilbert Square. I've just come from there. She turned and pointed up the street. Follow this road and you'll come to a synagogue. Take a left from there and then take the second right. Follow that until you hit Baker Street. From there, I know my way from there. Good night, then. She turned to... She tur- oh, sorry. I, d- I don't know what voice to give her. See, I have no girl voices. Good night, then. She turned away, seeming irritated. Wait, she turned back. Thank you, said Fred. You're welcome. Travel safely. Fred watched her go, and he noticed how long... And thick her braids were. They fell like ropes from beneath her from beneath her kerchief down her back to her waist. He wished he had asked for her name. He shrugged and hauled the coal chute down the road. The direction she had given him took him past the brightly lit synagogue around corners and eventually on to Bas- Basket Street, just as she had said. A short while later, he emerged onto Gilbert Square, awash with yellow light, and people finally dressed. Opera goers? People who go to operas. (laughs) Much easier to say. And rich folk out dining. The Gilbert Hotel shone with light from every one. Of its hundred windows, the new Bristol Opera House, bring, bearing its impressive clock face, glittered both from the golden ascents on its columned archi- architecture and the jewels in the dresses and hair of the women waiting on its steps. The cathedral loomed over the square, gargoyled and treacherous up high among its dark buttress and spires, warm and inviting through the wide open doors at its base. Oh my gosh, it's getting so hot in here.
<sighs> I think this will be the last recording for today because I can't take this heat much longer. Further gave this spec spectacle one look and no more. He crossed the square, passing under the ominous dome of the Archer Museum on the opposite side from the hotel. As immense as the building seemed from the outside, the museum had disappointed Frederick his first time through. He had enjoyed wandering among its displays, peering over objects, artifacts, and curious brought back from distant countries, kingdoms, and empires. But he was dissatisfied with the quantity of what he saw. He felt there should have been much more. Frederick left the square and had emerged into a dis district of the city's craftsmen. Master Branch had his workshop only two streets over from the clock clockmaker's guild hall. The old man lived above the store, and so had Frederick, ever since the old man had rescued him from Mrs. Treeless and the orphanage. Okay, so, let's review for two seconds. So, not only is Giuseppe an orphan, he's technically an orphan, and... Now he's an apprentice to Master Branch. Okay. Frederick saw that the lights were out in the shop, but on in the apartment above. He set the coal chute in the alleyway behind the building. The shop bell rang as he let himself in through the front door with his key. Master Branch, he called from the sharp, shop's darkened front room. Light tumbled down a narrow staircase to the floor from upstairs. He shut the door behind him and locked it. It's me, Frederick. You're out late tonight, came a voice from above. Having fun, I hope. Frederick clopped up the stairs. Some, how was your evening? Hm, usual. Frederick entered the the wool-paneled main room of Master Branch's home. It functioned as a kitchen a living room, a dining room, and a library without any shelves. Stacks and stacks of books lined the walls and stood ready if ready as if they hoped to be on shelves one day. The low ceiling made Frederick feel as though he had always had to hunch, but somehow the effect was warm and comforting. Master Branch sat by the fire, reading a cup of coffee on the small table beside him. He looked up with his sharp eyes. Is that cold us, Frederick? Yes, a coal man dumped his load almost on top of me. Nearly choked me to death. Hmm, very inconsiderate. Master Branch returned to his reading. We're almost there, guys. Like Two more pages. Oh my gosh, this is even longer than the first one. What? I must have missed a word because... Master Brands returned to his reading, his thin white hair like a fuzz of ho hoar frost. I have no idea what that is. On his head, there's some soup if you're hungry. Split pea. Thank you. Frederick ladled up a bowl from the coat from the cook stove, grabbed what was left of a loaf of crusty bread, and sat down on the table. A lot of commotion down at the docks today. What's that? Commotion. On the docks? Oh, so I was under- so I understand. You went down. Not for- not for long. There wasn't much there. There wasn't much left, sorry. Too bad, Master Burns said. But Frederick could see the old man had his eyes and his thoughts in his book. They fell silent, and the only sounds in the room were of the final settling and popping, and Frederick chewing. Oh, no. Why did you have to bring her up? I saw Miss Treeless today, Frederick said. Master Branch looked up. You remember her? Frederick fidgeted with his spoon. From the orphanage? The old man closed his book. I remember her. A vile woman. Yeah. Master Branch's forehead was creased and worn. Do you want to talk about it a lot? Frederick paused. No, thank you. Are you sure? I'm sure. Better to shut the doors on those memories. All right, then. More silence. And a short while later, Master Branch stood up. He rubbed his eyes and stretched. Whoop! I'm off to bed.
Good work today. Very good work. Frederick did not... Wait, what? Frederick did not thank him. Good night, Master Branch. I don't know why he's called Master Branch. It's weird. I'll be at the guild hall most of tomorrow. A few uh, apprentices are presenting their works, hoping to make journeymen. Can I come? What for? Frederick shrugged. No reason. Lad, you're not fooling anyone. As bright as you are for your age, you are only 13. Okay, time out. Another rewind. Giuseppe is 11, and he is 13. Write that down, too. That's important. That is very, very, very important. You are not ready, and when you get one chance to present yourself to the guild. That's not a rule. Perhaps not, but in all my years, I have never seen a prince make journeyman after failing his first examination. Frederick scowled, and his frustration compressed into a chunk of bitterness as gnarled as a peach. You will make journeyman, Master Branch said, but not for years. Oh, okay. Um, I'm pretty sure... Oh, never mind, it's Latin. I just read on a little bit, sorry. Skin... Dentis festini cosas sibitos patunerter. What does that mean? It's Latin, which is why I can't read it. It means hasty climbers suffer sudden falls. Try to be patient and remember that I'm only looking after your interests. Frederick nodded without accepting. The fact was, none of Master Branch's previous apprentices had ever made journeyman. Not one. The old man ducked into his bedroom. Good night, he said, and shut his door. So, basically, what Master Branch is saying is he's saying that pretty much after you fail the first examination, you never get another chance. It's either you make it or you don't. And I'm sorry for the long episode. We're almost there. We have one page left. We can do this. Oh my gosh, it's so long. Frederick finished eating and clear, cleaned his plate. He brushed, off, he brushed his crumbs off the table into his palm of his hand and tossed them in the wash bin. He lit an oil lamp to take downstairs, where he had a bed in a small room corner behind the counter. Master Branch insisted he sleep down there to make sure no thief broke in and stole the merchandise during... The night. Frederick went down and waited a short while until he thought Master Branch would be asleep. When he heard a faint snoring coming from the bedroom upstairs, he brought the coal chute in. Did he get one or two? I don't know. Frederick kept the clockwork man in the basement beneath the shop because Master Branch never went down there. Their space was small and cramped. There was a long workbench. My phone went off. Why? The space was small and cramped, but there was a long workbench and absent of windows, so Frederick could spend his late nights there in peace. He sized up the coal chute, satisfied with how well it fit. He would not. He would not be able to cut the metal tonight because the noise would make. Because of the noise it would make. He would wait until tomorrow when Master Branch was away on guild business. And then he would outfit the clockwork man with a chest. After that, he would complete the head. The trickiest, most difficult component of the clockwork. But after that, freedom. He would not fail as Master Branch feared. He was ready. Once he finished the clockwork man... And they saw how magnificent it was. They would have to let him work. Then he could finally be on his own, independent, self-reliant. Then he would not have to count on anyone for anything. Okay, um, we've gone on long enough. And for uploading purposes, uh, I'm just going to go over this one more time. I believe that uh, what you're looking at, the picture that you're looking at, it has the girl in it. So I'm going to guess, I'm not sure, but I'm going to guess that that girl that we saw in the alley, or that we asked directions from, that 
she might be the other one. And considering she's the same age, we know she's 13. So we have 11, 13, and 13. That's it for today, guys. Um, we'll review in the next episode, because this one is just too long. Thank you all for checking out the video. You know me, guys. DJ Daniel. This is going to be over 40 minutes. Gosh darn it. I'm out.